I think I can do it. Okay, so I am recording this so that I can post it on um, YouTube and update the tutorial that we have already there. Um, so just to warn you, um, in case you don't want to be public, just ask comments in the chat. Um, and then I put the link to the slides in the chat um, because there may have been an issue with uploading them to the CDS agenda. Um, I have some interactive components and it would be useful if you have the slides open so that you can copy things from the slides and paste them in the terminal. Um, and there's a few things that we're going to do on our, well, I tested it on RCS. If you have a Linux or a Mac system, it probably will work on your computer, but I am not 100% sure because I didn't test it on your computer. Um, and if you want to come back to this, now we have a 13 minute video tutorial, but this one's going to go into a little bit more detail. So first of all, I'm using some notation in the slides where um, when you see the yellow box, this is going to be a command that you should type in. When you see the pause, that means that I'm going to take a little break until people are caught up. Um, and when you uh, when you see something in blue, that's something I would like to do. Um, none of this is that complicated. Um, I'm mostly having you run stuff that already that comes in the um, in the repository. But um, I would just like mm -mm. that's that's how you know that it's something that you should do. And then I'm gonna look at the reaction, so you should have be able to have a reaction. Um, by at the bottom of your Zoom window, you can tell I finished these this morning because this is from this meeting. Um, you will see the reactions button, and uh, I'm going to use uh, the check boxes mean that you are um, that you have done the task, and uh, the X's mean that you have not, and you're intending to. There's some people I know are not going to be coming doing things along with us, um, so I am. Uh, so I'm not going to wait for you if you haven't responded. Um, okay, so that's how I'm going to tell what you're doing. So what is HEP data? HEP data is a repository for data. Um, and this is now the, um, the standard in high energy physics, which is why we are now using HEP data. Um, Maxime touched on it a little bit in his talk, but I'm going to tell you a little more. Okay, so here you can actually, here you can see the repository, a screenshot from the repository with all of the, um, the Phoenix papers, um, the data from each of the Phoenix papers, um, if you wanted to access the data. Um, here is what an individual entry looks like. Um, and you actually can get to this entry from uh, the archive entries by going through Inspire, it's linked. So all of these databases are connected. And we actually have a bit of an issue with RIC data now when they are not on HEP data because our theorists have sort of become trained to look for data on HEP data. So if they cannot see our data um, through HEP data, they are much, much less likely to actually cite our, our papers. Um, so we want to get our, our data up on HEP data. This is now required when you are getting a paper out um, which is why most of you guys should care. Um, but it'd be lovely if you go back and you do some of, of the, of the uh, older papers that aren't up there yet. So this, you can see a screenshot from one paper um, that one of my students formatted um, and the, it shows up, this is the abstract. There are links to the paper, um, to the journal um, and to the archive entry and to the Inspire entry. And then for every data set, for there you write tables of data so that it appears as tables like this um, that you can click on in the middle, and then each one brings up a, a formatted table, um, which just lists all of the data. Um, and here we do some nice whiz bang things where you can put the um, a thumbnail of the figure on uh, the slide on the table so that it, people can see what the data looks like. Um, but the big thing is you actually, I didn't, I didn't have any good screenshots from this. By clicking this download all button, 
you can download the data in multiple different formats, including as a root file or as a, um, as a Yoda file, which is useful for Rivet, or you can download the YAML files, which are what the data are in when you upload them to HEP data. Um, so that's really useful if you need to make a plot with data from a published paper, you can just download them as a root file for the plot. So why upload data to HEP data? Because it's basically used by all of the active experiments. We no longer need the websites maintained by collaborations, um, which as you may know, we've had a number of issues with. Um, it creates a, um, a link which is more or less permanent so that we don't lose track of the data. Um, it's searchable um, and actually what you can see on this slide. So this was uploaded on, uh, it says February 24th and it has been accessed 179 times since. A lot of that is searches looking for the data. Um, so if you have it up, your data up there, it's easier for people to find. Um, how we got into this in our group is that it makes the implementation of an analysis in Rivet easier. And now to get a paper out of Phoenix, you are required to do this. Um, so here is more or less the, the workflow. Um, the big thing that I'm going to talk about today is actually writing these files um, so that you can upload them to HEP data and get it all um, get it all formatted and make sure that it's right. Um, the rest of this, everybody's there to help you because we all want the data up there. Um, so you can read that the procedures on your own. So the first thing that we're going to do. Um, is make a HEP data account. So you go to hepdata.net. And I am going to have you guys, uh, some of you already have a HEP data account, which is fine. But uh, I would like you to click a reaction when you have done that. Christine? Do you know yeah. if we are able to connect it to our ORCID accounts later? Um, it, there's like options to sign up with ORCID, but I don't remember my ID, for example. Uh, um, I don't know, but I don't think you should worry about that because the reason you're going to get a HEP data account now is um, that you're just going to use the sandbox entry uh, okay. and when you actually put data in hep data i mean it matters which email address you use because when you go to put the data on hep data maxime is going to ask you for your email account associated with your hep data account so that you get the right email um but it actually is going to be approved by Maxime um, and linked to Phoenix. OK, I see. Thank you. So it's just a tool. It's a short term tool. Gotcha. Um, and while people are doing this, um, so I see a few check marks um, and not very many. Um, the big thing you're going to use, and I, I will interactively do this and go to um, HEP data. The big thing that you're going to use is the um, sandbox. And I'm going to have you guys do this um, a little bit. So you log in and this sandbox. And then you upload your uh, your test files there. And don't do it yet, but um, that's what you're going to be using. You have to package everything into a zip um, a zip file or a tarball. Um, and a few notes. So HEP data is um, finicky. 
what you will find is that the errors are frequently not useful. So what I recommend is going iteratively and slowly. So make a few small changes, upload it to the sandbox, see if it works, um, and don't make massive changes all at once. Um, and I would, and you also should be, the most common errors are related to LaTeX. So I ran into one yesterday where it didn't like me having squiggly brackets around something. Um, and so I just removed them and it worked fine. Um, it also is picky about white space, which is a little bit weird. Um, and so like, it depends on whether you have everything indented the same way. So just work slowly and, um, and methodically and make sure that you always have something working um, rather than trying to do too many things at once. Um, and I would add, this is not the time for showing your creativity. Um, just minimize time debugging and formatting. And that's basically the philosophy behind this is get it done. Um, don't be creative. All right, I see a lot of check marks, but and green check marks and no red X's. So I'm gonna move along. I'm seeing something like um, six people coming along. Um, okay, so when you go to do something in the sandbox, um, then what you do is click on sandbox and you're going to um, upload it. It lets you do many different formats. Um, we'll have you do one interactively in a little bit. Um, so here's an example of one of the, um, the errors you will get. This shows up, well, this used to show up in, on the web page. Now it sends you an email and tells you what the error is. And, um, and sometimes it is not clear. Sometimes you look at the error and you can tell um, what it is and sometimes you can't. So an example of one of the errors, which is somewhat cryptic is this one. Uh, and this I believe was related to it's expecting um, UTF-8 encoded files. And so sometimes if you make a file on a Windows machine, when you interpret it as UTF-8, a special character appears and you can't even see it. Um, so that is one of the weirder, harder to debug errors. So again, slowly, methodically, make sure it's always working. Um, this is an example. Um, and what you see, let's see, well, I think I have a few interactive ones. Okay, so what I would like you to do um, now is go to this entry. So if you just enter this link in your browser, um, and this is why you wanna have the slides open, you enter this link in the browser and it will download, um, a zip file, which you can then upload to the sandbox and make sure that you can actually see it yourself. And it will take a few minutes for you to get the feedback. Um, so again, we're gonna do the same thing, do the green checkbox when, when you've got that done. And I think I can, While you're doing that, I think I can tell you a little bit about what you're, what is in there. So when you have this zip file, the primary pieces are um, one YAML file, which absolutely must be named. Actually, my formatting, the formatting of the, um, it capitalized the submission. It absolutely must be a lowercase submission.yaml. If you do not update, um, if you upload something and it is not named lowercase submission.yaml, um, it will give you an error. So the submission.yaml um, is tells gives the format of everything, um, and the other, there's got to be one YAML file for each of the figures. Yes, Axel. I somehow missed what we're supposed to do with the zip file once we have it downloaded. Okay, 
once you have it downloaded, go to your the login to HEP data and go to your sandbox and, and choose that it. file. Yeah, choose that file. Okay, got it. So this is this is the um, if this doesn't work, we have problems. What you're doing is that you're downloading a working example and without doing anything to it, you're uploading it again to test and see if it works. I have a really quick comment. So I uploaded it the first time and got a submission error, but then the second time it worked. Interesting. I Even I have a submission error, figure eight ANC. Interesting because it should. Seems yeah, to have worked for me. The second time it, it worked. I don't know if it's just because like multiple. Well, yeah, I don't know. Try just doing it again. Uh, yeah, I'm trying. I love the loading menu, by the way, the loading thing. It works the second time. Excellent. So I can't explain why it's not always working. And what you guys should have seen is that, first of all, it will eventually load to your browser window when it works. Um, and the other thing that it does is it sends you an email. So you will see that I, well, in my inbox, well, here's an earlier one. I have a gazillion emails from uh, HEP data telling me that I have a successful upload. Okay. So what you're going to have to do when you make the, um, when you format data for an upload is come up with each of these um, each of these files. And what um, I'm going to show you how to use a tool called YAML Maker, um, which makes the um, it makes the figure files, but it doesn't make submission.yaml. You have to make submission.yaml manually. Um, there's just no good way to automate it. So it's a semi-automated procedure. Um, Often you're starting with text files from data, especially if you're working on previously published papers. It can take a little moderate manipulation to get them into text files that, this thing, that YAML Maker can use. Um, and then you need moderate formatting for uh, moderate manual formatting, um, usually mostly of the submission.yaml in order to get a working entry. Um, so a few points. In this now, if you're actually working on a paper that, uh, if you're not working on a, on a previously published paper, but something that you are getting out now, you don't necessarily have to start with a text file. There are a couple of tools. There's a tool called hepdata dot uh, underscore lib that works with root except I caution you, I know one person who was able to test and run it and it took him about a month. So YAML Maker is not sophisticated, but it has the virtue of working um, and being easy to use. Um, there is also this you can try, which is another, um, another package for helping with HEP data uploads. Um, and I, we were not able to get it working easily with text files. So we decided to stick with YAML Maker. And what you're looking at for, uh, for a previously published paper, it can vary. So it can take something like when I do it, now that I've done a lot of these, it can take me two hours for a simple paper without a lot of data tables. And it can take me up to 20 hours. And well, on the long end, there was one we had that was about a thousand tables, which took us 
probably a lot longer than 20 hours. So the more data you have, the more it's going to take. Okay, so now I'd like you to download and install YAML Maker. So um, these are the commands you need. Um, so you're looking at slide 16. Um, if you do this on RCF, um, I, there may be more elegant solutions, but um, these two commands are going to load a different compiler. It doesn't work with the default compiler on RCF. Um, and I just went with loading a different compiler. Um, if you're running on, uh, if you're doing this on your own laptop, um, running a, a Mac or a Linux machine, you don't need to do the first two lines. And what you should see after you've done this is um, it tells you that it compiled everything and um, it won't it won't give you a ton of output because it works. And I'm going to have you do the same thing and click the green checkbox when you have done this. Now, what this does mean, you're going to need to transfer some stuff on and off RCF. Um, if you are using RCF, I am assuming that everybody here knows how to do that already. Um, and while you guys are doing that, first of all, I want to give a shout out to my student who did this as an undergraduate, Tom Krobach. Um, we did this as part of a course-based undergraduate research experience, and I gave them an open-ended task of just figure out how to get these data formatted for HEP data. And um, he was helping his fellow students, and we went, oh, this makes it a lot easier, and decided to, to we have been using it now for about two years, but he did this as an undergraduate. Um, and then don't get intimidated. All these YAML files are, are just formatted text files. So it's nothing fancy. Um, you're just taking the data in whatever form you have them and rearranging them um, into a different formatted text file. I see three green checks and I had had, um, I had had uh, five or six people going along. So Christine, I, there are a few comments uh, in the chat box also. Ah, thanks. I had missed those because I was looking at the responses. OK. Um, so one is I don't have the ORCID ID, so I'm, I am unable to create the HEP data account. You should be able to create a HEP data account anyway. You just have to give it an email address. Um, ah, and so Abdullah had been doing, uh, had been working with YAML Maker before. Um, to do, to update YAML Maker, you want to do git pull. So I can do this on, um, so here I am on RCF. Oh, actually, and I think I did even do updates on, before I updated my RCF version. So git pull. What I did this morning, admittedly partially during Maxine's talk, was update some of the examples so that it works a little better. I only see three green check marks. So I see one more. Um, can I get some feedback? Uh, five, all right. I think we had five before as the maximum. So let me ask, if you are stuck, please speak now. Fantastic. Okay. So then the YAML maker takes the formatted text file as an input and um, so there's some, if you're working off of a 
data from a previously published paper, you have to manipulate the data a little bit. I usually use, well, I sometimes use a spreadsheet because it can be easier to move them, move data sets around in a spreadsheet. What you need is, um, so this header has, um, has an x-axis, whatever the x-axis label should be, um, the number of data sets, so in this case it's four, um, and then the y-axis label. Um, in many cases, your y-axis label is the same for all of your data sets. Um, a small point, YAML maker, so YAML maker requires all of the data sets to have the exact same number of data points. HEP data doesn't strictly speaking require this, but if you're going to use the output for, for instance, writing a rivet analysis, the output is bad for doing a rivet analysis unless every single table of data set in the table has the same number of, of bins. So what we have been doing is that if you have, for instance, spectra where there's a different number of data points for every um, for different centralities, we break it into a couple different tables. Um, these are well. These this is a feature of of YAML Maker that needs to be updated because it's not quite handled correctly. Um, YAML Maker calls them labels, but they are actually qualifiers. And I have a little bit more on that later, but you should at least put something useful because that's going to be how you tell the different data sets apart later on, even if you have to fix it later. Um, so then bins, yes, you should use bins. Um, if you have, um, if you would like to, for instance, for spectra, also list the, um, for instance, the correct weighted average, the easiest thing to do is to treat it as an extra Y value. Um, if you want it to work for rivet, you need bins. Um, so then these two lines, do you have X uncertainties? Um, this is a, another feature of YAML Maker we need to fix. It allows you to have X uncertainties, but uh, HEP data doesn't allow them. So the answer is always none and none. And then how many uncertainties? So in this case, we're putting in three uncertainties. Um, YAML maker requires the same number of uncertainties for every data set in the table. Um, you can fix some of this by hand if you have a different, um, a different format. Okay, and then for each data set, this is, um, you want the first X value, the second X value, and then the Y value in each of the uncertainties. Um, if you have asymmetric uncertainties, it assumes that the uncertainty takes two columns. Um, and then there is a delimiter for each new data set. Um, and I, uh, yeah, so some of the earlier versions, the early version had a dash, but that had problems with negative values. So we changed the dash um, to a space so that it can handle um, any value of any X values. Okay, so now um, what I would like you to do is actually run YAML Maker. So you should be in the YAML Maker directory. And um, this, uh, the first argument, well, the argument is basically the debug level. So if it's working, you can use zero. It doesn't spit a lot out to the screen. If something's not working, if you put one in, it will give you a lot of information that's basically helping you figure out if you, um, if you correctly, um, if you correctly formatted your file and, um, if something didn't happen right, you can look at the output from one. So we're gonna pause here again, and I'm gonna ask you guys to do the green check mark when you run it. And this is where I, I updated the examples a little bit this morning.
Okay, I see four check marks and so for for me it says um, command not found. Are you in the YAML maker directory? Yes, I checked that. Did you do make? No. Okay. You have to do so do make. Yep. And now try it again. Okay, and what do I expect to happen? Um, in the first case, nothing. Okay. Because it's just running it and it's running it in quiet mode. And in the second case, it's going to give a lot of output to the screen. Yep. Um, and what you will also see is if you look, once you have run it, if you look in examples input in the same directory as the input file, um, it writes a YAML file right there. So um, that is the that is then the file that has the formatted data. Um, so it is. Let's see. In my little chart here, it is one of these files. So then, um, if we look at that file, um, for the so what YAML Maker does is it keeps you from having to manually um, write. Uh, write these YAML files or to write code yourself that writes them. But if we look at what's in the file, the first thing is the, um, the header name. And then in the case of bins, um, you will see a low and a high for each number. Um, and for every data set, you're going to have a header and then qualifiers, which we will come back and edit later to make sure that they're formatted correctly. And this is the part you don't want to do by hand. For each value, it says values and then lists the errors. And HEP data will completely choke if the number of data points on the x-axis is different from the number of data points on the y-axis. Um, so, YAML Maker is good at doing a lot of the grunt work. All right, then looking at this submission.yaml. So the submission.yaml, um, there's no good way to automate this. Um, so the first thing you need is the abstract. Um, and I will warn you about a few things. Um, there cannot be line breaks in the abstract whatsoever. Um, sometimes special characters, if you're copying and pasting the abstract out of something else, sometimes there will be special characters that sneak in. And uh, HEP data will give you what is usually a completely unenlightening error when that happens. And often the error is um, related to LaTeX. So the way that I usually do this when I'm formatting a new paper is that I start with an old submission.yaml and I don't change anything except the names for the tables um, and I make sure it's working. And when I add the abstract, I upload the abstract and test without doing anything else so that if the abstract is breaking things, I can figure that out carefully. And there's a few little hiccups where it will interpret the um, it will interpret the LaTeX a little bit less um, less clearly. Um, so you want to be careful. Um, and just I watch for the late, usually the errors are LaTeX errors. OK, so then here's where you can add additional resources. And there's now a template in there that lists each of the, um, that lists what we do as standards in Phoenix. Um, and then when you get to this name, this is how the figure, how the table is labeled on the HEP data webpage. Um, you cannot have LaTeX in the table name. 
and you cannot repeat table names if you have repeated table names it uses it shows the last one whatever that is um, and then you can accidentally not have all your tables but you thought you did it okay um, a figure caption and then these parts right here um, keywords and, and reactions you won't see this in HEP data, but this is really important because it helps the data be searchable. Um, so don't overlook it just because it looks okay on, on the website. Um, and then image thumbnails. So, um, ah, so actually, I think, yeah. So the other thing here is that it, you see that there's figure5.yaml. That is the name of the YAML file, which it is looking for to get the data for that particular figure. You can call it basically anything you want, um, but, uh, well, it, I think it chokes on spaces, but nothing out of the ordinary. Um, and then <coughs> if you, you can add image thumbnails. Um, so you can have these additional resources and, a few little logistics. Um, so it's going to display it on a web page. So it needs to be a format that displays in the web page. And if you're going to do a thumbnail as opposed to something they can just click on um, to see it, it must start with the name thumb underscore. It won't find any, it won't accept anything else as a thumbnail. Um, so if you're doing this, Note that in the Phoenix HEP data repository, um, there is a script which copies every PNG in a directory to some underscore something dot PNG. Um, and there's also a script which converts all ETS files in a given directory to a PNG um, with reasonable resolution. Um, so if you're say, if you're working off of something say out of the archive and you're getting EPS figures because that was what was uploaded, there are ways to, to automate this or at least semi-automate it. Okay, so now we're gonna run a test. So in this examples directory, you, you can actually call your, um, you don't have to use tar, I always use tar, um, but you should package up submission.yaml um, xbin with errors .yaml and the um, the PNG files. And then to, if you're doing this on RCS, you have to transfer it to your laptop to upload it to the sandbox. So I think that's going to take a little bit of time. So I so again, let me make sure the feedback is cleared and then I'm going to ask you to do the um, green check mark when you've caught up with me. So in this examples directory, um, in the repository, you'll find a working submission.yaml and then uh, PNG for the, um, for actually it's the Phoenix t-shirt plot. Sorry, I might have missed this. In the HEP data sandbox, we should just go to upload new files and upload the tar file it produces? Yes. OK, thank you. So if you did this on RCF, you're going to have to transfer it to your laptop first. I see. OK, thank you. And we're on slide 23. Um, I'm going to do it along with you. Uh, Christine, I tried twice and I get error both the times. What error do you get? Uh, upload failed. Yeah, in the case of those errors, we do get an output where it gives some messages we could forward to you. Or, or an email, an email. 
Yeah. Um, so it's me... error in table zero dot YAML and table one dot YAML. Uh, don't tell me I forgot to. If do you see in submission dot YAML? Can you look at it and see if you um, if the name of the file is this xbin with errors dot YAML? No, the submission file is table underscore zero dot YAML and table underscore one dot YAML. Okay, so I am committing a fix, but if you want to, um, I thought I committed that, sorry about that. Um, what you should be able to do is change that to the name of the file that is actually there. Um, so, okay, you have two choices. You can either fix the name of the YAML file yourself, or you should, so now I'm on RCF, not my laptop. You should be able to do git pull from there and it will upload a fix. And then you'll have to make the tar file again. Uh, do we need to rerun YAML maker or anything? Uh, the executable? No. Yeah. Just... You, you don't need to rerun YAML maker because, um, well, a few, a few reasons. The problem was in submission.yaml and that is not made by YAML maker. Okay. And um, the other thing is that actually I have an extra copy of the table which YAML maker made anyways. Um, so it's not using the one that you made when you ran YAML maker. It's using the one that's in the examples directory. If you do exactly what I, what I said and you're running tar from there. And what, what's the output file that should be produced now? Okay, so now what you should do after you've done git pull to fix the submission.yaml, oh. redo this part where okay. in the examples directory of the YAML maker directory, you're going to tar um, submission.yaml, xbins with errors.yaml, and the two PNG files into one tarball. And I see two check marks. So I'm going to assume the other three three people who were coming along are still a bit behind. Probably because of my mistake. I was fixing it this morning. Well, it was a nice on the fly fix you did there. <laughs> well, I already had the local fix, right? I just had accidentally not committed. The next thing that I try to do on the fly won't work because I already used up all my good luck. <laughs> That's the way it always goes. Yep. Okay, I see four, and I think Axel, you were doing this along with us, and I don't see a check mark yet. Yeah, I'm still sort of confused. Are you working on your on RCF or your laptop? Um, both. Okay. So I I down I transferred the the 
test.tgz. And then I thought I uploaded it, but nothing happened. Did it leave you, did it direct you back to the, if you thought you uploaded it and you get this message, you, you get this screen again, what that means is that it failed. Um, and that probably means that you um, somehow didn't end up with using the submission.yaml that had my fix. Yes, yeah, so you might have to do git pull. Yeah. And then retar. And then retransfer to your laptop. So that's three places so where there's the git clone. Wh where do I where do I start that? Okay. So from your YAML, well, from y somewhere in the YAML maker directory. It doesn't matter if you're at the parent directory or one of the um, subdirectories. Okay. Type git pull. And just get clone, okay. Not not get clone. G I T P U L L. So that's gonna go to the repository and get the latest version. So G I T P N L. What's the last P, one? That's a U Slash? P P U L L. That's pull. So oh, like push oh, and sorry, push. Sorry, and sorry, I'm being stupid. I have bad handwriting. I was okay. trying to write it big to make life easier, but then my handwriting's terrible. And now okay. what you should have seen if you had at some point is that you should have seen something like this, where it's basically telling you that it updated examples slash submission.yaml. And just for good measure, look at that submission.yaml. And it should give, in the table name, it should give you the name xbinwitherrors.yaml. It should not say anything about table one or table two. So you should see okay. this and that I should see in data file it should say right. x bin with errors Right, I, I do see that. Okay. But I had also edited the, the old YAML file uh, and changed those names. Okay. As I'm long as somehow has... miss, missing one of the PNG files. Um, do you have the other one? Because they're identical. So do if I you have... have one of them, you can just copy raa.png to some underscore raa.png because they're identical. Oh, those two are identical? Yes, because I, I was putting them up just for, well, for educational purposes. In principle, the thumbnail could be lower resolution, but that's more work than it's worth usually. Okay. And, so and now I do then, the tar again. Yep. Yep. Okay. And now I have to move that over to my computer. Yep. Yes. And now I want to upload that again. Yep. No, that's not what I want. Um, no, here.
No, it somehow sends me back to the upload and archive to sandbox. Okay. Um, I think maybe forward me the error because um, there is no error. Where do I see an error? You will get um, an, oh, an email. email. Yeah. I have a sneaking suspicion somehow one of your files got, so you said you edited submission.yaml. Something is, something is wrong in it. Um, but I can't tell what without looking, well, the error might tell me. I think this was my last interactive component. So let me say, Axel, I'll, if you forward that to me, I'll get back to you. Okay, I, I just forwarded it to you. We, we can, Okay. we don't need to hold up everyone. Cool, yeah. I will probably be able to figure out what went wrong. Maybe, well, I, I shouldn't be so brash. Sometimes the <laughs> errors are just tricky to figure out. Okay, so then if you look at this submission.yaml, this is what is um, this is what is in the repository as an example. And when you're coming up with your own, I would say start with this one, don't make one from scratch. Um, and there's a few things that we're doing um, to help fit the logistics on the Phoenix side. So one is it's all in comments. So there's this header in comments that you don't see on the table. Um, but it will say which PPG number it is, the, um, oh, this, this should be the title of the paper. I was making stuff up. One of my, my kids are into Paw Patrol, so everything is Paw Patrol. Um, the, uh, the, you wanna have the journal reference if it's already published and the Inspire ID. Um, and this makes Maxine's life a lot easier when he has to coordinate the actual approval because he needs to know the Inspire ID to actually get everything linked together. And then here you're going to put who actually prepared this. So when I have my undergraduates do it, I put their name and then who to contact if there's issues or questions with the submission. So when I have my undergraduates do that, I put me as the person to talk to. Um, and it, but for most of you guys, those will be the same people. Um, there's a PPG liaison and a reviewer. You try to have those not be the same people. Usually the reviewer is from the IRC. Um, and then there's a, some extra resources we have by default with things like image files, the internal Phoenix webpage with the data points for reference, if this is an already published paper where that is a pop, not all of these are populated web pages, which is a problem. Um, but if it exists, include the link, even though it will only work for Phoenix collaborators, and then include the archive link um, so that people can pull up the paper. Um, so those are some Phoenix specific things. They aren't strictly speaking required for HEP data, but it's good to have them. Okay. So some tips, don't get creative. This is, this is a grunt work task and your goal is just to get it done. Um, you don't get points for creativity or aesthetics. Um, start with a minimal working example and work iteratively. Um, please use bins. We're trying to implement all of these in, in Rivet. And um, if we've had, had to back, we've had to reverse engineer what the bins were and it's tricky um, and it's easier to do it when you're working with the data um, from the start. Um, don't worry too much about LaTeX formatting. If it, get the information up before worrying about the aesthetic. Um, there's some sample files if you want other working examples. Um, we've started, so now to get the data uploaded, you need to have the precision of the numbers match the uncertainty. Um, and there's a script that we actually originally got from STAR and we tweaked it a little bit um, so that it's a little bit more flexible. So 
if you have to format a lot of numbers in the HEP data repository, you want to look in the scripts directory because it will make light work of a lot of things that are otherwise front work. Um, qualifiers. So this is the thing I wanted to come back to. YAML Maker does not do this correctly, and it was on our list to fix it this summer, and it's not fixed yet. Um, qualifiers are supposed to provide limits for things like kinematic variables. YAML Maker treats them as labels. And the only way I know how to do it today is to fix them by hand or you know, clever scripts. Here is an example of what it should look like. This is from PPG 173 from a draft that we need to get up there. So here you can see that there's variables, PP trig, PP associated, and uh, whether or not it's the near or the away side and then the centrality. So this one has four different qualifiers. They appear above the labels um uh, oh, sorry above the access labels um and these are searchable in hep data so if you do it correctly it's actually it works very nicely for the data um for searching for some for some measurements you don't need any qualifiers but you rather frequently at least need centrality um and this is what it should look like in the yaml file um so you need for, you have a separate section for qualifiers. If you have no qualifiers, you can just cut that. But um, so you don't need to have any qualifiers, but if you have qualifiers to get them formatted correctly on the web page so that um, every single entry has, um, so that these, so that these um, sections right here, if I can get my pen, so that these line up nicely, you need to have the exact same number of qualifiers for every single data set. Um, the values, well, the labels need to be the same. So if you have PT trig for one data set, you need to have it for them all. Um, but the, the values can and should generally be different. So in that case, it was, uh, these were correlation functions for two, for dihadron correlations. And so there's a lot of kinematic variables to specify. Um, some features, YAML Maker lets you format the data with um, uncertainties on the x-axis. And HEP data doesn't accept these values, so this is not a useful feature. YAML Maker does not accept text values on, so we're going to try to eliminate that, it, but don't use it. It doesn't accept text values on the x axis, but HEP data does. Um, and HEP, it requires every single column to have the same number and format of uncertainties and data points. HEP data does not. Um, we're not going to fix these last two, they are features. And I have gotten a two minute warning, so I'm just going to, um, I should be able to wrap up. If you need the data bin, so if you want to do rivet and you should want to do rivet, and I can point you towards rivet tutorials, you need to have binned data and the bins cannot overlap. You need to have independent um, variables on the x axis. So you can't, for instance, plot V2 versus N charge. You would need to have the data formatted differently. Um, and you should not, you, you should use centrality instead of model dependent variables because rivet can't do model dependent variables. Um, and there is some extra things about, uh, about Phoenix data in particular. For those of you who are younger and maybe want to go do something useful, um, you can look at old Phoenix data. And I'm going to leave the, just note that the slides are up there that point to you how to get old Phoenix data, because we still have about 150 papers that are not in HEP data. And they're currently, those data points are not available to anyone outside the collaboration. <clears throat> if you want to help um, format published papers, or if you need help with your, with formatting your data, let me know. Um, we would love to help. And that's it. Thank you so much, Christine. That was awesome. And we could do a successful hip data
submission. I would stop recording for now and then we can open the floor for questions. <laughs>